we see a lot of growth opportunities in Africa, and in that regard, we want to be part of the growth story, especially in those markets that we believe are going to deliver superior returns for us and as well as for our shareholders. So countries such as Nigeria, Tanzania, um, Zambia, Angola are very important in the short term as part of our growth strategy and we're looking at opportunities in each of those countries. And you've also said that it's going to be a combination of acquiring existing banks and also setting up new businesses. You mentioned the likes of Nigeria. Tell us about uh, acquiring a bank in Nigeria given the fact that many of the troubled banks during the crisis are now up for sale. Yes, there are a number of opportunities that exist in Nigeria as the Central Bank of Nigeria is looking at consolidating the market in terms of the number of banks in Nigeria, as well as reforming the banking sector overall. And that presents a number of opportunities, and we're busy at the moment looking at uh, some of the opportunities there. Obviously, we have to do the process uh, properly in terms of you know, looking at which opportunities would be appropriate for us as first round and uh, we're going through that process. Looking at the overall market, do you think that there is big opportunities in that country? We certainly believe there are major opportunities there. If you just look at the fundamentals of the economy in Nigeria with more than 150 million people and the fact that you know there's a process which the Central Bank of Nigeria has started uh, which will attract foreign investors into that country and as we know banks play a very important role of being a proxy of what happens in the economy and that presents opportunities for ourselves. And if you look at some of the key sectors that are driving economic growth in Nigeria, the telecom sector, the power and energy sector, the oil and gas sector, uh, they're very important, as well as infrastructure broadly. And there's a lot of investment and reform which is taking place in Nigeria, which certainly will see the growth rates of Nigeria's GDP uh, continue for a couple of years to come still. Looking at the likes of Kenya, and I'm glad you mentioned the telecom sector because the telecom sector and telecoms companies have really teamed up with the banks in Kenya to come up with very innovative products and it's all about banking the unbanked. Tell us about mobile strategies going forward and mobile banking uh, going forward uh, and how you could perhaps leverage more business off that. Mobility is going to be key for accessing people who are unbanked today and getting them into banking, mainly because a lot of people have come to use the cell phones, uh, in fact, uh, depend on the cell phones, and they trust the cell phones. And today there are technologies that are available to uh, remit, uh, to pay, and uh, to deal with that parties uh, in using the technology as a platform. And we ourselves, through FNB Mobile Banking, are growing our ability as well as uh, the ability to serve customers using cell phone banking. We have more than two million active customers in South Africa today and it's one of our fastest growing uh, businesses and we see the opportunities for rolling out the same platform in a number of countries where the physical infrastructure of branches uh, may not be appropriate or may not be available in a number of cases. And we see major opportunities uh, in that regard, and especially because uh, if you look at the level of penetration of cell phones, particularly in the continent versus the number of bank accounts that are available, you will immediately see that you know, there's a big gap and therefore an opportunity to serve a lot of people using mobile technology. Uh, tell us about some of the strategies that you will be implementing, that you've perhaps the successes that you've seen in South Africa and how you're going to implement those in rural Africa. If you take, for instance, the characteristics of South Africa, we have a lot of people who are sort of in the third economy, as well as those people who are in the first economy. And the characteristics of people who are in the third economy are very similar to what prevails in the rest of the continent. And we've growing, we're growing our ability to, for instance, allow customers to remit money to people who may have a bank account, as well as increasingly to people who do not even have a bank account. And that technology is very, very simple to use. And in fact, you find that uh, people in the lower end of the market are leapfrogging people like you and I who may have access to the internet and online banking and so on. And uh, the take up has been extremely encouraging. And we've started to roll out the same kind of platform in some of our subsidiaries, such as Namibia, Botswana, uh, Zambia. And the take up is extremely promising. So we see major opportunities for growing that part of the business. So us a mix between uh, the retail banking side of things and your strategy uh, going forward in Africa versus the corporate uh, strategy as well, because you have said that you are planning to follow your corporate clients who are expanding into the rest of Africa as well. So will there be a, a fair mix between the two? That's one of the reasons why we've appointed Jabu Kete as the CEO of First Rand Africa to drive coordination between Rand Merchant Bank, which principally 
deals with corporates, as well as you know we've created a corporate investment bank, but also bring F&B, which is predominantly in retail and commercial banking, uh, to drive a more coordinated approach in terms of how we're getting into the new countries that we uh, have targeted. And that's quite important because when you look at retail banking in Africa uh, as a whole, maybe excluding South Africa, you will soon find that uh, the level of development of retail banking is still very low and therefore that presents a major opportunities. Most of the banks deal with commercial and corporate customers, but maybe hardly uh, provide services and products uh, to retail customers. So we think there's a major opportunity to address that gap. With the, all the opportunities that are in store in Africa, the cost of doing business in Africa also seems to be a slightly elevated. And when you look at access to credit for most consumers, when you're looking at double digits um, lending rates uh, and even a higher to, uh, the higher end of the 10% towards 20, in some countries at 25%, and these are very scary numbers that we're looking at here. And this is why credit extension in Africa is not that robust. But then again, the risk profile is far different to what we see in South Africa. How do you plan to bridge those gaps? What we have managed to do uh, in this country, as well as in, we're starting to roll out uh, in, in a number of countries, is to develop a low-cost delivery model to serve retail customers so that we can reduce the cost of doing business. And today, you know, for instance, in South Africa, we're rolling out on a very aggressive basis what we call the F&B Easy Plan branches. Uh, they're a low-cost model based on a technology platform which is very easy for customers to use, which enables us to reach out to customers, offer services and products uh, that are very competitive, in fact, that are very affordable. And it's a model that we believe we are going to be able to expand and roll out in, in the countries that we are targeting in the continent. So, and it requires, a very diff it requires a very different mindset in terms of how you think about it because clearly we have systems and core banking platforms that have been in place for many years uh, that may have a higher cost in terms of how you deliver products and services to customers. You require a very different mindset to deliver a low cost model. So we've created that and we are able to roll it out in a number of countries, which we think is going to be the way to go if you are going to be service pe uh, servicing people at the lower end of the market. Taking a look at the possible returns for Africa, what have you priced in at this point? I mean, you're looking at expansion, you're looking at acquisitions, you're looking at starting up uh, new businesses in various nodes. What kind of growth are we expecting? It's very difficult to uh, actually project in terms of numbers and what we expect. At the moment, I mean, about 90% of our profits are still generated in South Africa, and about 10%, give or take, are generated in our uh, operations outside the country. But I think the important thing to realize is that growth rates of our businesses outside South Africa are actually faster, yes, of a low base, but faster than the growth rates uh, that are being generated in South Africa. Clearly, one must recognize that uh, there's still a lot of work to do, that you need to build an infrastructure and so on, but we are quite confident that in the near future, our businesses in the rest of Africa will play a very meaningful role in providing growth opportunities for the group. We also hear news that you're eyeing out the Indian banking sector. Tell us about possible synergies that could play out there. At the moment, we're very fortunate in that we are the only bank from the African continent that has a licensed operation in India. That business is growing quite well. We're benefiting quite a lot from the trade flows between India and Africa, uh, but also from African businesses that are moving into India because we see an increase in that regard as well. Uh, we're involved in a number of areas which include trade finance. We deal in commodities, particularly uh, commodities such as gold or coal. And we're looking at further opportunities to leverage off the platform that we've created in India as India itself grows in areas such as infrastructure, but also, you know, there are new reforms that may be taking place in India in terms of the banking sector that will allow foreign players, foreign banks, to play an even bigger role in the Indian economy.